Ephesians 5:22 through 33. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the church, of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her body by the washing of water with the word, that he might present himself to the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Thank you, Clay. <clears throat> this morning we're continuing our series on roles and responsibilities. And now that we're kind of in the middle of this series, I'd like to not recap, but show you where we are and where we've been. So I guess it's recapping, but I want to give you a, an idea of how I think about this, how I visualize it. Uh, because when it comes to a lot of what we're going through, if you haven't noticed by now, when I read scripture, I, I tend to read it very visually, uh, the concepts. I, I really have ideas in my mind of how it stands out, what it looks like, how it's layered. And so I want to show you what I have in mind and what we've gone through. In this series, we've been looking at the roles and responsibilities we have. And this is all going to start with the new self. This was the foundation for this series, that we are new creatures. And some of the roles and responsibilities in that is to no longer be who we used to be. And we are to grow in the image of Christ. And that, that is the foundation for all the roles and responsibilities we're going to look at. So this morning we're going to be looking at a part of the family. Uh, and last week we looked at the family unit. Kind of how the Bible views family, various roles and responsibilities we have in family to take care of family and that kind of a thing. And this morning, we are specifically going to be looking at husbands and wives. Um, next week, I plan on doing parents and children. But this is still a part of putting on the new self. Because a part of putting on the new self is growing into these new relationships. How I treat my biological family how I relate to my spouse, how I relate to my children and my parents. This is all a part of putting on the new self still. It's not separate from it. Even though Jesus himself was not, was not married and uh, did not have children, we are to ask ourselves, what kind of a spouse would Jesus be? What kind of a parent would Jesus be? What kind of a, a, a worker would Jesus be? Uh, we're to really ask ourselves a lot of these things. So the new self fits uh, is the basis for fitting into the family unit. Um, but we're also going to be looking at later on the church, the roles and responsibilities there are in the church. We're going to look at church offices like elders, deacons, and evangelists. We're going to look at what it means to be a man or a woman in the church, what it means to be older or younger. And we're also going to look at talent-based service that we contribute to the work of the church according to our talents and what we're able to provide. 
but that once again still fits into this idea of the new self. We're not, we're not separate from it. It's all contained in there. So we started with the new self a couple weeks ago. Last week, we looked at the family unit. Now within the family unit, we're going to be looking at husbands and wives. Uh, but, but the new self doesn't include just these things. These are the things we're really going to be looking at over the next few weeks. But it also includes things like work. How do I, how do I go to my job? Uh, what does it mean to work? Um, it, it's going to include things like that. It's going to include things like our hobbies. The new self is the foundation for your entire life. And within your life, there are these things like family and church. And those are the two we're really going to focus on. But I want to point out it includes more than just that. So that's to kind of give you an idea of where we've been and where we're going and how I view this. Now, we've been looking at the family unit. And within the family, you have husbands and wives. Now, I want you to consider that even if you're not married, this is uh, an important lesson. Uh, it's important because you may become married at some point. And if you know these things going into marriage, it's going to make things a lot easier than trying to change things mid-course. Uh, it's important uh, because you, even if you never become married, you are a member of a church. And there are members in the church who are married. And we are to look out for one another. You, you may find yourself needing to admonish a married person. And you have to know what marriage is and how God views marriage in order to be able to admonish that kind of a person. Uh, it's important because even if you never become married, it teaches us about God. It teaches us about how God views the church. Uh, as we read, that marriage is really compared to Christ and the church. Uh, view, it, it teaches us how God designed the world. And this design he has in mind. So this is an important lesson, not just for people who are married, but even if you're not married. It's important for us to understand marriage. It teaches us about God. It teaches us about our brothers and sisters, especially even the married ones, and what they're going through and the challenges they may face. So we can be a little more compassionate uh, toward them in their situations. Now, as I said, marriage is rooted in the disciples' role and responsibility to put on the new self. Because it is rooted in that, I hope that one of your big takeaways this morning is that the roles and responsibilities of the husband and the roles and the responsibilities of the wife are not all that different. They're actually very similar. Both are to grow in the image of Christ and both are to help each other grow into the image of Christ. There are going to be a couple differences and we're going to look at those, but even those differences are not as big as you probably think. The roles and responsibilities of husbands and wives are much more similar than you, than you might expect. Uh, in putting together the lesson this morning, that was one of my big takeaways. When I sat down and really compared the roles and responsibilities of husbands and the roles and responsibilities of wives, I found they are not all that different. And so that's one thing I really hope you'll see in this. And that's why I'm, I mention that it's rooted in us putting on the new self and helping each other then put on this new self. So first we're going to look at kind of what marriage is, some things the Bible has to say about marriage. And then we're going to start looking at the roles and responsibilities of, of husbands and wives. So what does the Bible say about marriage? And I got this really starting in our passage in Ephesians 5. We're going to start actually with right at the very end, verses 31 through 33. If you have not opened your Bible there, please open your Bible to Ephesians 5. We'll be spending a lot of time here. In verse 31, Paul is quoting from Genesis and says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The first takeaway that we learn about marriage is that marriage is a part of creation. Paul references here Genesis, 
that therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is uh, from right at the beginning of creation. This is before Genesis chapter 3, where sin enters into the world. So marriage is a part of creation. When we say creation, yet we have to understand we're not just talking about the creation of physical objects, although that, that's part of it. When we talk about creation, we also read about things like how we are spirits in bodies. This idea that, that God took the dust of the ground and breathed life into it. Or we read about how man was made in the image of God. And I, I, I am not of the opinion that we're talking about something physical there. Especially when we compare it to uh, being made in the image of Christ and how Christ is the image of God and we are to grow in that kind of an image. Marriage is a part of creation. And in fact... Part of uh, creation. So that, that's one of the first big takeaways we read about marriage. It's not man-made. It's something God made just in the same way he made the fish, in the same way he made the plants. He made man and woman, and he made marriage. Now, because uh, marriage is a part of creation, it is designed by God. Uh, and because it's designed by God, God's design is how marriage flourishes. You know, Dallas Willard, when he would speak to people, he would tell them, if, if, you, if you could find something better than Jesus, Jesus himself would be the first person to tell you to go for it. And I, I want to suggest to you that when it comes to marriage, if, if you could find a way to flourish better than God's way, God would probably be the first person to tell you to do it. That's how much he loves you and wants what's best for you. However, I don't think there is a way that's better than God's way. God's design for marriage is the way that humans flourish in marriage. Uh, if you try to enter into marriage without intending to uh, react in it according to God's design, it would be very similar to something like driving down the highway and just suddenly deciding that you're a uh, brake is your accelerator and your accelerator is your brake. Like you, you just decide that and make that up. I mean, how, how much is your car going to respond if you just decide that and make that up? I mean, it's, it's not going, you're probably going to crash. And in the same way, marriage is designed by God. And we can't just decide that it's designed to function differently. This is God's design, and God's design is how marriage flourishes. And if we don't like that, uh, then you, you can keep in mind God doesn't require us to get married. You don't have to get married. If you don't want to do it God's way, you, you really don't have to get married. There's nothing in Scripture that says you're required to. Uh, in fact, it is completely possible to live a godly life, a, a life that is God-oriented and fulfilling, and not get married. Jesus did it. Paul did it. There is nowhere in the Bible that says you have to get married. Uh, and I think this escapes much of the notice of our church today. Sometimes it's assumed that a person must get married. Or if they get to a certain age and they're not, that there's something wrong. And that's really not at all what the Bible teaches. Bible teaches you are under no obligation to get married. And in fact, there are times when it's better not to get married. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, for example. And Paul starts making this case about how you know, no one's obligated to get married. And in fact, they're better if they don't. And then he starts getting into this coming distress that is going to come upon them. And he says, in his opinion, it is better for them not to get married during that time. So not only is no one required to get married, but there may be even situations in which it's better not to. So those are just some things to keep in mind that the Bible teaches about marriage. It's a part of creation. It's designed, and God's design is how it flourishes.
Uh, no one is required to get married. Uh, another thing to keep in mind about marriage uh, that we learn from Scripture is that marriage is going to be the basis for the immediate family. If you read in Genesis, you have God making man and woman, their one flesh, and then he tells them, be fruitful and multiply. And I think that order really illustrates to us that marriage becomes the basis for family, that a man and a woman, as we read in Ephesians 5, verse 31, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The image is that you have a man separates from his family, a woman separates from her family, and they join together to become a family. Now, this doesn't mean that the man never treats his previous family as family or his in-laws as family. It means that your new family becomes priority. That becomes the priority. You leave your father and mother, you hold fast to your spouse, you become one flesh, and that is your priority. Now, you, you can still treat your family as family. I, I don't want to say don't. In fact, I think as we saw last week, there are times where you're really obligated to. But your new family is going to be uh, your priority. Now, this is going to be God's design. And I want to stress that. This, I think, is God's design, but it doesn't always happen this way. For example, single parents. I think God's design is that marriage is the basis for family. However, if you have a single father, a single mother who has a child, they're still a family. We would never say they're not a family. Uh, and they still receive many of the blessings of being family. So I want to be clear that we're talking about God's design, even if it doesn't always um, play out like this. Lastly, one thing I want to point out the Bible teaches about marriage is that marriage is designed to end with death. Um, hold your finger in Ephesians and turn over to Luke chapter 20. This is where Jesus has entered Jerusalem. He's being um, challenged. He's being questioned. And in Luke chapter 20, he's being questioned about the resurrection. You know, they give this absurd situation where a husband, a, 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 a husband dies and the wife, according to the Leveret Law, just keeps marrying and marrying and marrying the brothers down the line. And Jesus' response to this in verse 34 is, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to that resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more because they are equal to angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. Verse 36, he says that the reason they neither marry nor are given in marriage is for or because they cannot die any more. Which to me really illustrates that marriage is designed to end with death. There are some um, heresies out there that teach that a, a man and a woman can be married for all eternity. And that's, that's clearly not a teaching of Jesus. Jesus understood marriage ends with death. Uh, and in fact, I think it's, it's really designed to be that way. So those are some things we learn about marriage if you turn your Bibles back to Ephesians chapter 5. Just some basic things we learn uh, throughout the Bible about marriage. Marriage is a part of creation. Uh, marriage is designed by God. No, God doesn't require anyone uh, to be married. And marriage is really going to be the basis for family in this design. Uh, and a marriage is also designed to end with death. Some, some basic things that we learn about marriage throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. Now we'll get into the juicy stuff. The roles and responsibilities. In Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 22, you have the responsibilities and the role of a wife. Paul writes, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, 
and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. The only responsibility that's illustrated here is for wives to submit to their husbands. Now, I want to be clear that submission does not mean something like blind submission. Where you just do what you're told and you, you're told you, you, you ever see the Stepford wives? That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about robots. We're not talking about automatons. We're talking about not blind submission. That is not the kind of submission we're talking about. Submission does not mean that a wife is not allowed to participate in discussions about the direction of the family. It does not mean that. Does it mean she just keeps quiet while her husband makes all the decisions? It doesn't mean that a husband makes her behave that way. If a husband makes her behave that way, there may be some other issues going on. I also want to be clear that we're talking about Christian husbands and wives. That, that's the context here. I should have said that at the beginning and I didn't. We're talking about roles and responsibilities when you have two Christians who are married to each other. That's what I'm dealing with. So it does not mean that a wife is not allowed to participate in discussions about the direction of the family. She's very much allowed to. Very much allowed to be a part of the direction of the family, how the family is led, and that kind of a thing. Uh, it does not mean inequality. It does not mean that the husband is better than the wife. It doesn't mean that men are inherently better than women. That's not at all what is going on here. I say this because it is often assumed that this is what this means. Uh, it is presented as if this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about blind submission. We're not talking about a wife not being able to contribute to the direction of the family. And we're not talking about inequality. That, that is not what's going on here. What we are talking about is that the husband is the ultimate leader of the family unit. Now, especially when you start having children, the wife is still a leader. But the husband and wife work together, but the husband has the ultimate leadership when we're talking about this. The husband is going to be the, the, the final leader if you want to think of it like that. Although, as we're going to see later, this doesn't mean the husband doesn't submit in certain ways. So submission is going to mean things like your husband does have the final say. It is going to mean things like you encourage your husband in his leadership because most husbands have never been husbands before who have, and they're learning how to lead. It's something you learn how to do. Most people are not born learning how to lead in a biblical sense. There's some people who are, we'd say are natural born leaders but very rarely do they lead in a biblical sense. This is something that a person grows into. But I also say to husbands, you know, learning how to submit is something your wife is probably not born knowing how to do either. Not in a biblical sense. We're not talking about blind submission. We're not talking about bottling things up and just letting your husband get his way, but secretly begrudging him against it. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about letting the husband lead but still being able to participate in the direction of the family. I, don't wanna, I really want to continue this idea. What it means to submit to your husband. It means to allow your husband to lead and be the ultimate leader. But you have to ask the question, why? Why should I submit? If, if you're a wife, why should you submit? What is your reasoning that helps you in this? And I think there's an amazing passage in 1 Peter that the reason you submit is because you hope in God. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and, and hold your finger in Ephesians 5 because we're going to come back to it. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, 
You can really start in verse 1 where, where Peter is writing about wives being subject to their own husbands. And he discusses this idea of verse 3, do not let your adorning be external. Verse 4, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. In verse 5, he says, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. That is such an important passage in understanding uh, why the wife submits. It's not because your husband is smarter than you. Your husband's going to make mistakes and, and probably very stupid ones. I can, I can speak from experience here. It's not because men are superior to women. It's not because you don't submit because you hope in your husband or his abilities. Because your husband is going to do well sometimes, he'll probably do poorly sometimes. You submit because you trust that God's way is better. Because God designed marriage. You submit because you hope in God. That's what Peter says here in 1 Peter 3, 5. This is how the holy women who hoped in God used to endure themselves by submitting to their own husbands. That is so important for understanding why the wife submits. And again, we're not talking about blind submission. We're talking about the husband being the ultimate leader in this unit consisting of husband and wife. You submit because you hope in God and you trust his decisions. Not because you trust your husband or hope in your husband because he will inevitably let you down. It's not because men are smarter or better or anything like that. It's because you hope in God. Now, as I said at the beginning, that the, the role of husband and wife is not all that different. And in fact, submission to the husband is really going to be the key difference between the responsibilities of husbands and wives. However, this, this doesn't mean that the husband never submits. Yes, the wife must submit to the husband. This doesn't mean the husband never submits to anyone. The husband also has to learn how to submit, just as the wife does. As we read earlier in Ephesians 5, this idea of verse 22, where he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands, it comes out of verse 21, which says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. He's speaking to the whole church there. That includes husbands. Husbands also have to learn how to submit to the needs of the church that he's a part of. Or you consider Romans 13.1 where Paul instructs them to submit to the governing authorities. Does that mean the husband doesn't have to? Well, no, the husband has to submit to governing authorities too. Or in James 4.7 where James writes, Submit yourselves therefore to God. The husband also has to learn how to submit to God. It's true that the husband ultimately leads the wife, but the husband has to learn how to submit just as much as the wife does in different areas. It is not just that the wife is the only one who has to submit. In fact, there is a much greater emphasis in the New Testament on the equality between husband and wife. I can't stress that enough. Turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, Paul is writing to Titus how to teach the older women and what the older women are to teach the younger women. So in Titus chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Older women likewise are to be reverent behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. In verse 4, and so train the young women. And these are then going to be in the instructions to the young women. To love their husbands and children. Does this mean the husband doesn't have to love his wife or children? Of course he does. To be self-controlled. Does that mean the husband doesn't have to be self-controlled? <clears throat> to be pure. Does that mean the husband doesn't have to be pure? 
working at home. And the idea here is not that a woman is not allowed to find work outside the church. The idea here is not to be lazy because women at this time, their work was in the home. It was really unheard of for them to get work outside the home unless they're probably a prostitute. There were some exceptions, but th that would generally be the case. Does that mean a husband's allowed to be lazy? Kind. Is a husband allowed to be unkind? Submissive to their own husbands. Now that, that's going to be a difference, isn't there? But why? That the word of God may not be reviled. Does that mean the husbands are allowed to revile the word of God? In fact, couldn't the, uh, the opposite of this be said, the inverse, that husbands are to lead that the word of God may not be reviled? I hope you notice that, I mean, there, there is not much of a difference. Yes, the wife is to ultimately allow the husband to be a leader, but the, the way the husband and wife grow together is so similar. And in fact, there is much more of an emphasis on the equality between husband and wife. Also turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians chapter seven, starting in verse one. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman, her own husband, right? That, that's the temptation to either gender. And the responsibility is the same that the husband who has a wife and the wife is to have a husband who also falls into this temptation. Verse 3, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. Right? One doesn't dominate the other, they're equal. Verse 4, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. It's total equality. Verse 5, do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I hope you can really see that sometimes we focus on this little tiny difference, submission, and we blow it out of proportion when the New Testament is so much more focused on the equality between the husband and wife, which was completely unheard of in a pagan society. Completely unheard of. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5, changed the world. The idea that there are equal rights between husbands and wives. It changed everything. Now, there is the responsibility that the wife has to submit to her husband. And as I said, that responsibility is ultimately to let him be the final leader. But the roles of husbands and wives are not nearly as different as they're often made out to be. In fact, the New Testament is much more focused on the equality and similarity between men and women, and especially husbands and wives, than they are on the differences. All right. Turn in your Bibles then back to Ephesians chapter 5. Paul then starts discussing the husbands. In verse 25, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Husbands, responsibilities you have, love your wife as Christ loved the church. I'm going to be really honest with you. Out of the two responsibilities we just read, which do you think is going to be harder? Yeah. 
to allow your husband to lead or to love your spouse as Christ loved the church. I'm not saying letting someone lead is easy. But this is very consistent in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that there are greater responsibilities placed on the husband. And I think this is partly why the wife allows the husband to lead is because he has the greater responsibilities. You love your wife as Christ loved the church. For for the sake of brevity and clarity, I've kind of divided this up into two different ways we're going to understand this. Um, The first is with sacrifice and service. In verse 25, husbands, love love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I've narrowed that down to two things, sacrifice and service. Christ gave himself up for the church. For those of you who have ever led, whether whether in a family or maybe in a work setting, if you've ever been a manager of some kind, you know that a good leader is one who understands leadership as a greater form of servitude. You are actually more of a servant when you're a leader than when you're the person underneath. Because you have more responsibilities. You have more rules to follow in that sense. You you have to become a greater leader, a a greater servant in order to lead. Now this is going to mean a few things. This is going to mean something like the wife is never to be treated as a means to an end. Never. You don't take advantage of this whole idea of submission. And you don't have a live-in maid because your wife thinks that she has to blindly submit. That's, that's not what we're talking about. She is never to be treated as a means to an end. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Sexually, financially, never to be treated as a means to an end. The image that is going on here is that the wife allows the husband to lead and the husband leads with sacrifice and with service. And in this sense, you you almost have this image of both serving each other. You do not have the image that the husband does not submit in some way to the wife. He is the ultimate leader. But, but wives are going to be needed, they're going to need to be taken care of, provided for. And the husband is required to submit to her needs when those needs arise. Some of the responsibilities a husband has is to sacrifice and to serve his wife. Another image that's presented here is with an eye, I say this as an eye toward holiness and splendor. Read verses 26 and 27 with me. Paul says that, you know, a husband is to love the wife as Christ loved the church because Christ gave himself up for her, verse 26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. Now, ultimately, we're talking about Christ in the church, but I want you to consider that we could take this as a very practical application for the roles that husbands play in the lives of their wives. Husbands are to love, to serve, and to sacrifice for their wives in such a way that their wives can be presented one as uncorrupted by this world. That the things of this world have not contaminated the wife. And two, he is to sacrifice and to serve in order to present her in splendor. This word as in splendor can be uh, translated as something like wonderful. Something like with honor. Or with radiance. I want you to notice that this is the purpose for sacrificing and serving. 
Because verse 25 leads into 26 and 27. That Christ gave himself up for the church, and in the same way the husbands are to love their wives, that he might sanctify her. It's, it's all connected. You don't sacrifice and serve in order to pay the bills, although there may be times for that. But that's not the point of your sacrifice and service. That, that's not the primary focus here. The primary focus is on your wife's holiness and splendor. That she can be presented as wonderful, as radiant. She can be presented with honor, uh, as uncontaminated by this world. That's a big responsibility, isn't it? But I think that if, if we can grow into people who do this, I am a husband, if I, if I can grow into someone whose ultimate goal is my wife's holiness and splendor, I will have run a pretty good household. A household that is uncontaminated by this world. A household where the people in it are held in honor and respect. See, when we focus on this whole idea of the wife submitting and get caught up in that, you lose so much of this passage. There is so much more going on here than the wife must submit to her husband. So much more. And I hope that you see that it's not like the husband gets off scot-free. In fact, there is a sense of submitting to the needs of his wife. Now, he is the ultimate leader, yes. He makes the final decisions, and he will be held accountable to those decisions. But he is to lead in such a way that the, the needs of his wife are taken care of, and he sacrifices and serves with an eye toward her holiness and her splendor. Another responsibility that the husband has is to treat the wife with equality. So you look in verses 28 and following. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. The husband has the responsibility to treat the wife with equality, to treat her as his own flesh. I really hope by now you see that the New Testament places a greater emphasis on the equality between husband and wife. Now the wife is to submit to the husband's leadership, but because of that, she is placed in a vulnerable, a vulnerable position. And the husband has the responsibility not to take advantage of that vulnerability. But instead to treat her, uh, to cherish her, uh, and to treat her with love and respect. As I said earlier, this, this is completely bonkers to the pagan worldview. Pagans did not do this. Wives were second-class citizens, if not lower. Husbands were under no obligation to respect their wives. They were no ob uh, under no obligation to, to, to treat them with any respect or, or even to be sexually exclusive to their wives. No obligation whatsoever. And Paul is, is getting these people out of this pagan worldview to get them to see the absolute equality between men and women. All right, those are roles and responsibilities of husbands. Uh, in wrapping this up, I just want to go over a few things of both, of both husbands and wives. Some roles and responsibilities that we have. Uh, first is to grow closer to God together. As I said at the beginning of this lesson, that the roles and responsibilities of husbands or wives are rooted in putting on the new self. And you work in this together. You support each other in this. And you as one unit grow closer to God. Uh, as we read in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, this includes things like spending time together in prayer. 
This can be things like spending time to read your Bibles together in the evening. Setting aside some time for this. Or as we talked about a few weeks ago, redeeming the time. Taking back some of this time for better things. And growing closer to God together. A responsibility of both husbands and wives is going to be to forgive each other. Because this is going to be a very close and intimate relationship, you will hurt each other deeply. And you're going to have to learn how to forgive each other. Uh, this means no longer holding things over each other. Uh, holding that kind of power onto someone. We have to learn how to forgive each other. Uh, this is going to be things like um, not focusing on whether or not the other person is doing their part, but instead focusing on you doing your part. This is a, a great responsibility of both husbands and wives. We don't, we don't make mental notes of when someone failed and, and when they're not doing what they're supposed to do. You, the moment you're keeping count, the moment you're keeping a tally, like, you're going to really start growing in bitterness. We don't focus on that. We focus on what we're doing and us doing our part. And when, when both spouses are focusing on doing their part, the job gets done, doesn't it? Really, so make it, making an effort not to focus on whether they're doing their part, but on whether I'm doing my part. Uh, and lastly, a responsibility is to keep anything out of your marriage that will come between you, your spouse, and God. You, you got to cut it out. I'm going to let you kind of populate with your mind what this might be in your own lives. I know I have some things in my life that, that I've, I have made a concerted effort that I just, I got to cut it out. I cannot allow this into my life or into my house. Because it comes between me, my wife, and my relationship with God. It comes between all of that. We have a responsibility to keep our homes holy and pure and God-oriented. Marriage is a God-designed relationship. It unifies a man and a woman into one flesh. Now, I've focused a lot on the practical applications here. But, of course, Paul spends a lot of time focusing in Ephesians 5 on how this is an image of Christ in the church. Verse 22, he says, Wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Uh, verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Marriage is meant to reflect that relationship. It's also meant for, uh, for those who are married to better understand that relationship. That it is a relationship of unity. A relationship that is unified with love. Uh, and a relationship that is ultimately unified with by the power of God. Now, if you're here this morning and you have any questions, any thoughts, if you're in need of any prayers, whether your, your situation is one of, of needing help in your own marriages, or maybe you have questions about what it is to be married, please talk to us. There, there are a number of people here who can help you answer those questions. Uh, if you need help in any way, if you'd like to be baptized, or if you have something to discuss with the church, uh, now is the time to do it. There, there is no better time than now because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. If there's anything that we can do for you, please make your need known now as we stand and sing the invitation song.